Wonderful to be here uh, in Vienna. Uh, it's been a really fruitful 10 years of collaborations, and, and I'm pleased to be here. Um, I thought I would speak a bit to the theme of the conference, um, thinking about riverine landscapes as coupled social ecological systems, and share a few thoughts about how I see the social ecology of rivers and human-river relationships um, by drawing on a few observations from rivers where I come from in the Intermountain West of the United States, understanding that while some things are generalizable across uh, the, around the world as it relates to uh, rivers and river functions and river connections with society, many things are very context specific. So I don't expect that everything I speak of today to be applicable everywhere, um, but hopefully this will uh, generate some discussion and I look forward to your comments. Not all of my work is on rivers. Um, my career has been really like a braided river, uh, bringing together multi multiple facets. I've studied forests and farms and wild berries and water uh, management uh, more generally, climate, and the community dynamics of all of these things. Uh, but my first research was on a river, the Nile River, um, and my most recent research has involved uh, rivers in, Western, in the Western United States. Um, well, I'm not really sure if my braided river is coming together like a drainage basin analogy into one channel, or whether it's fanning out into a delta, I'm not really sure. Perhaps some of you can feel this conundrum as your work comes together and flows over time. But I'm pleased to be here to speak about rivers today. Um, the heart of our theme here is really this relationship between people and rivers. Um, there's so many terms in the scientific literature to describe this relationship. Um, and of course, our conference here today, um, it really focuses on this socio-ecological system, but there are so many different ways and terms, different, different spellings and different ways to write these terms. We won't get too technical about this today. Um, but we have the socio-hydrological system, coming more out of hydrology and integrated water resource management, much more quantitative modeling here. We also have the hydrosocial cycle work, which is coming more out of human geography and political ecology, much more focused on power and critical theory. And there are some tensions between these two uh, areas of domains of relating um, people uh, and the environment, uh, particularly rivers and water. But we also have the SES group, the social ecological systems coming out of policy and governance, focused more on institutions and the resilience of our, our systems. Um, we've got out of the natural resource social sciences more broadly in conservation psychology, the human dimensions of rivers, looking at human river relationships through looking at attitudes and values uh, and, and the management of rivers. Uh, then there's the broader inter- and transdisciplinary research and practice that relates to these socio-ecological or social-ecological technical systems. And many of these fields overlap and interact. Um, I'm not quite sure what the relationship is between the SES group and the hydrosocial cycle, but perhaps some of you can enlighten um, us here today. Um, I think it's possible that the term social ecology could be used to unify all of these disparate term and all these terms and all this jargon that we have out there in the scientific literature. Um, Stokos, Liano, and Hip in 2013 outlined four core principles of social ecology, and I would review those with you today, and they would, will come up throughout the rest of my presentation today. Um, they highlight the multidimensional nature and structure of the relationships between the, the social world and the ecological world, and the multiple levels of analysis that are needed to get a handle of this on this complex system. There are interactions, um, interacting systems of influence with dynamic relationships that shape various outcomes. Um, the environment shapes uh, human life and activities, and in turn, people modify these environmental systems. Uh, but also people in different uh, entities and groups act on and with each other <clears throat> in relationship to the environment. And this is where important power dynamics come in within society as well. It takes diverse methodologies uh, and often transdisciplinary actions getting out beyond science 
to uh, understand and manage these complex social ecological uh, issues. The APT approach, or the Applied Participatory and Transdisciplinary Approach, um, has often been cited as being important in managing these complex or often re referred to as wicked problems in this, in this intersection between society uh, and the environment. We can take all of these principles and apply them to the pursuit of understanding river conditions and riverscape conditions. A lot of times what we're looking at here when we think about rivers is we have an over, uh, overarching uh, goal to, uh, for natural rivers. We're looking at the uh, natural processes and the uh, Western Rivers Conservancy in the United States has sought to uh, highlight the great rivers of the West uh, and to uh, develop a list of the most outstanding natural rivers. Uh, and of the 1,600 rivers that were identified as having natural qualities, notwithstanding uh, many, many more that, that do not fit their criteria even for consideration, only 168 rivers were given the letter grade of A as having um, these qualities of the best natural rivers in the Western United States. Their criteria included things like um, free-flowing rivers without dams or diversions, with good water quality uh, and non-urbanized shorelines. They looked for biological health, uh, wilderness areas and roadless areas. Uh, they did look at recreational suitability, but only a very narrow interpretation of those uh, recreation opportunities. But what about those uh, rivers that are less natural? Are we to just ignore them, write them off as lost? Um, Rivers, we're talking about rivers that, uh, that are important for industry or agriculture, uh, or transportation, or recreation. Um, it depends on our vantage point, how we look at these particular um, rivers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the natural rivers. Uh, Whittington in Australia some years ago defined a healthy working river as a managed river in which there is a sustainable compromise agreed to by the community between the condition of the natural ecosystem and the level of human use. <clears throat> thinking about the dimensions of rivers and riverscapes, we can start with thinking about the ecohydrological characteristics uh, as we determine what is healthy or what is impaired. In the US, the Environmental Protection Agency has developed a watershed health index uh, using six broad domains and many, many indicators um, and to include things like landscape conditions, geomorphology, habitat, water quality, hydrology, biological condition. And these are in many cases proxies for what is it expected to in lead to more greater health or more impairment. Not necessarily uh, a full array of actual measurements of water quality or, or condition themselves, but they're meant to give us a good sense of what we know to influence the health of rivers. And we can map these indicators throughout the region, and we've, I've looked here at the Intermountain West region of the US, and we can take these indicators and you can then see the pattern on this linear continuum from impaired to healthy. The very healthy rivers being the very dark colored here, the high index scores, the, the orange colors here, more the, the more impaired, the less healthy rivers in, uh, with the lower scores. <clears throat> but we can add dimensions to our understanding here. We can bring in the socioeconomic characteristics of riverscapes and, and rivers. And then in my opinion, things get perhaps even a little more interesting. As you can see here, when we take, do this and we look at the relationship between median household income and watershed health, we don't see a clear linear relationship. Um, but there are certainly some emergent types of relationships. We can think about this as a simple two by two matrix and then we can typify the cells. Um, as you look here at the A circles, right, um, you can see watersheds with high watershed health and high incomes. These are found in areas like uh, near Yellowstone National Park, Teton National Park, um, uh, high amenity communities, um, a great deal of wealth and good rivers, high quality rivers. The B circles are urban areas. 
uh, where we have high median household incomes in general, but we have low watershed health. Um, the C circles are the opposite. With low income, these are very rural or American Indian uh, tribal communities, but they have high watershed health. The D circles show the lower Klamath River Basin, where there are lower income tribal communities and lower watershed health, mostly due to agricultural nutrients that have built up in the system and a series of dams that slow the flow and, and contribute to problems. Um, and we can look at more dimensions too. We can add socio-demographic socio characteristics because the populations are changing rapidly in many watersheds. We can think about the socio-cultural characteristics, about how people interact with each other and with their environment, their values, their experiences, their conflicts, their collaborations, their uh, agreements, their disagreements, their governance arrangements, their general ways of life and how they act with and upon rivers. And rivers flow through these complex mosaics. We can think about assessing attributes near and far from the river or upstream and downstream. And, and, and we can also think about the temporal dynamics as these riverscapes certainly change over time. In a recent paper focused on the Columbia River Basin in the northwest of the US, my colleagues and I outlined a way of thinking about the interconnections between the ecological setting and the human social setting of riverscapes. This ecological setting has these geomorphological components, these habitat components, biodiversity elements, um, and the human social setting draws upon the social dynamics, uh, the governance institutions and the economies, and the resource management actions and stewardship uh, efforts and local actions in the areas. Uh, both of these settings sit within a broader regional climatic uh, setting where we have disturbance events and hydrosphere processes and climate um, processes that in some ways are, are removed and indirectly related, but certainly have an influence on this relationship between the human social and the ecological settings. Uh, there are certainly many different mechanisms and connections that link the human social setting with the ecological setting. And I would suggest that many of these relationships depend and, and, are, and are influenced by our human river relationships that, that we hold and, and think about as motivating what we think should be done and how we act um, in our riverscapes. Do we seek to master or control a river for power or to control floods? Or do we see our role as stewards of rivers and nature in otherwise human-dominated landscapes? I think this might actually be Santa Claus in his summer home in central Illinois. Or do we seek to participate in, and look in awe and wonder on the power of a river in a protected area like in Jasper National Park in Alberta, as seen here? And I would posit that these links between the human social setting and the ecological setting are, see, are driven by how we see our relationships with these rivers and how our management and our governance systems are oriented um, for these pursuits. My colleagues here in Austria uh, and elsewhere, some in this room uh, I see, have, we've explored some of these types of human nature relationships uh, over the last 10 years. And we've come to believe that these relationships are multiple. We can hold multiple relationship types in our, in our minds. They're very dynamic and changing and they're very context specific. Uh, we all likely hold different human uh, river relationships at different times of our lives and during different situations and circumstances. And entities and governments can embody or promote different human river relationships as they seek to motivate environmental actions. Um, Kerstin Beck's work with river managers um, highlighted that while river managers might be, feel that their job is to be a master of, of the river and to control the river, they might personally hold more of a stewardship or a participant per perspective with regard to that river. So this is complicated. <coughs> Excuse me. Back in our Columbia River Basin work, 
We suggested that we have various critical vital signs that we can use to measure conditions in these riverscapes, <clears throat> including water quality, water quantity, the abundance and diversity of fish and wildlife, uh, the quantity and quality of habitat, and then also some things that we may not all often measure as part of our river assessments, but the human health and quality of life related to these rivers and the satisfaction of stakeholders with various actions and processes. So it's a bit of a balancing act, trying to keep the, the social and these eco-hydrological components in our analyses. But I would add that it's often actually more of balancing various interests rather than this simple dichotomy. And we can think of the different interests that we might have in rivers that we've worked on. Um, maybe it's thinking about flood control or agriculture, recreation, industry, aquatic habitat. And then when representatives of these various interests come together and start to interact, sometimes we get the emergence of what we call, through generalized actions, th through the emergence of what we call a community field, whoops, um, where we can actually work together to better understand uh, what we hold in common and have a common purpose as we move forward for solving complex problems. <clears throat> there are a variety of methods that we can, that are useful for assessing riverscape conditions. And some of these methods can be undertaken back in our offices, right? We can work with secondary data. We can work with uh, the existing uh, information that we already have related to rivers. Um, but we can also use what I call drone methods, where we can send out a survey to get information or, or actually bring back samples to the lab for further analysis. Or we can use more explorer methods where we can engage and work with folks in these communities and learn more from them. Um, or we can in get involved in more engagement methods where we can uh, really participate with local stakeholders and leaders in understanding and influencing riverscape conditions through much more elaborate field methodologies. In northern Utah, we constructed a social environmental observatory that we called GAMET, which stands for Gradients Along Mountain to Urban Transitions. And the GAMET monitors real-time inputs of water uh, and changes that happen as it moves through this uh, landscape into the three valleys down below. And we can measure the changes in magnitude and the patterns of the urbanization and human behaviors that relate to these three rivers. And we've got six aquatic and four terrestrial st uh, monitoring stations aligned on this altitudinal and land use gradient. Um, and so for eco-hydrological parameters, we can get this real-time data back into the office at 15-minute intervals. Um, the gamut also incorporates the multi-scale social systems in the area, but not with real-time data. We haven't yet developed the ability to put a probe in a person and have the, their thoughts and actions sent back to us at 15 minute intervals. I don't know why, but we haven't figured this out, to, how to do it ethically at least. Um, and so in the end, what we have here is more cross-sectional data uh, at different points in time and space where we can representatively sample uh, people from parks and households and cities. We can build relationships with people in local governments and state governments and really learn about the policies and the uh, planning efforts that are underway. This means that engagement methods as we get more close and interact with river systems where we can involve science with local and professional knowledge brokers um, can provide up to more up-to-date information on a fuller set of indicators of riverscape condition. And so from this point now, I'd like to share with you um, a, a couple of examples and, and ways in which these multiple dimensions can be unpacked a bit from different rivers where I come from. We'll talk about the Jordan River in Utah and the Gallatin River in Montana. And here we can explore the multiple dimensions and the levels of analysis of rivers and get a feel for the dynamic human river relationships and social systems working to improve uh, river conditions. 
When you look at the uh, watershed health index that I mentioned earlier, the Jordan River watershed is the least healthy watershed in the region. And when you look at the statewide index with a different color scheme here, you can see that the majority of the sub-watersheds in this Jordan River watershed are the least healthy in the state. The Jordan River runs through Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, the, the metropolitan area there that is the dominant city in Utah, in our state. It's a short river. It's just 44 miles in length. But 30% of the sub-watersheds in this, wa in this uh, watershed are highly impervious, uh, uh, well above the threshold of 30% after which stream health is unavoidably degraded, according to Arnold and Gibbons. The river runs northward from Utah Lake, which has experienced major algal blooms in recent years, to the Great Salt Lake, which is a terminal saline lake. Um, and many Utahns will say that water that reaches the Great Salt Lake is wasted, although there are really important bird refuges and there are certain stakeholders that, that do feel strongly um, and have support this, these issues. The Jordan River runs through 15 municipalities, runs through three counties, all of which is to say it ru runs through a very complex governance landscape as well. Socioeconomically, we can see here that the river runs through the lowest income areas of Salt Lake City, the lighter colors. Um, while further south, we can see golf courses and larger, big, uh, expensive homes. As, you, as the river runs north, you can see more abandoned cars and generally more smaller, modest homes. The river also runs through some of the more racially and ethnically diverse neighborhoods of Salt Lake City, um, where we have sometimes in some of these census tracts more than 60 to 70 percent of the population are non-white or Hispanic or Latino or of refugee um, communities. And recent dissertation research by a Utah State University PhD student has revealed that perceptions about this river in some ways match that low watershed health score. Uh, there are some negative attitudes about this river. This quote from a young woman from an adjacent neighborhood says, usually the Jordan River, nobody goes there. You don't go there, nobody plays in it. There's a trail, but nobody really walks it. We would go, my dad plays soccer, we would never go near the water. Uh, we would always stay away, even though that didn't make sense because that was a cooler place. We'd stay on the maintained parts and not really go by the river. He hearing on the news, finding bodies in the river and things like that just kind of fed into, don't go there. Negative issues that are commonly raised about the Jordan River include homeless encampments full of litter and debris, there is a large homeless population in the Salt Lake metropolitan area, and they seek shelter and water in these river corridors and under the bridges. But the county people come in to clean these up regularly, removing hundreds of, th of thousands of pounds of garbage every year. They provide resources for these people and to offers to offer to help them, but often they are so heavily addicted to drugs that they just move back into these same areas and the cycle continues. Other negative issues include crime and safety problems, bad smells, invasive species, few recreation opportunities, and many would say that this river has really been neglected over time. But our other research suggests a more complicated story. We surveyed households in multiple neighborhoods in Salt Lake City, one neighborhood where the river runs through and another one further away. In this neighborhood, the river runs through Poplar Grove is what it's called. 81% of the people in this neighborhood said that they had spent time in or near the Jordan River. And in the neighborhoods further away across the interstate freeway, 48% said that they had spent time in or near the river. And this is quite high. On the other hand, those who live close to the river did not feel the quality of the river was good. Uh, but overall, 69% of those living close to the river um, had a positive, said that the river had a positive influence on their quality of life. And over half of those in other neighborhoods as well.
Well, much of the positivity that we found about the river can be attributed to the efforts of a large coalition of cities and counties and engineering firms and nonprofit organizations who have dedicated a great deal of time and money to restoring the Jordan River. For many years, the Jordan River Watershed Council flexed its regulatory muscle in trying to really promote flood control on this river, and they had some challenges. Um, but in 2008, a new consortium of, uh, of entities came together to put to, uh, with a blueprint for the Jordan River, a much broader approach and plan for developing and restoring this full river. They used more of a quasi-governmental and voluntary uh, organizational scheme to carry out the plans in the river corridor. And a green trail for recreational uh, activities along the river has just recently been completed and they're working on new trails to connect the tributaries. And now they're also working on the blue trail so that there can be recreation in the river from one end to the other. They're restoring the river piece by piece, taking out dangerous spillways that have actually killed kayakers who've been trying to recreate, to restore more of a natural flow to the river, to reveal more recreational space as they change these structures. They're working to restore stream banks to avoid high levels of erosion and to gain more recreational aspects or places for fishing or play, children's playing. And plans include creating wetlands uh, and parks along this river. The work on the Jordan River is highly community-based. Eric McCulley is an environmental consultant and he works uh, on the premise of these five goals uh, to achieve corridor-wide success. It doesn't look like a traditional ecological approach to restoration. I will tell you I was surprised to think that the engineering consulting firms would take such a broad social ecological approach to this river restoration. It includes community stewardship, place-based learning, uh, public education, collaborative management, as well as improving ecosystem integrity. And in Taya Carruthers' dissertation, she quotes a man saying that the Jordan River is one of the few natural elements in this urban area. Another person said the trails are getting better and you can go by the river. And yet another person raised a concern, saying, so if we were to imagine the Jordan River becoming this beautiful place and schools improve, what kind of communities are going to want to live there? What communities are going to get pushed out towards other places? Sort of patterns of gentrification that happen when communities improve, that's another concern I think about. There have been many efforts to involve the broader community uh, as volunteers and students in restoration and learning in the, in the river corridor. There have been art installations that have put in with the help of young refugees who live in the area. One example of this new community-oriented approach to restoration is a project called the Three Creeks Confluence Daylighting Project in a location where three tributaries that run underneath in pipes under the city come out to join the Jordan River. Um, they are planning for improvements. As part of the planning process, they co collaborated, the city collaborated with university researchers who went into these neighborhoods and used iPads and Spanish language surveys and other language surveys and interview protocols to understand what the local people wanted to see as in this very local area. Uh, they wanted a pedestrian bridge for fishing uh, access uh, and, and other features for local music and cultural presentations. A city representative said, I think the greatest benefit of the research they did for us was it provided a representative sample of, Glendale, of the Glendale community. And I think it was rather eye-opening for us to see how we were really missing a demographic. They then added these features to the plans and they're currently raising money for the project. So to summarize the Jordan River situation, despite the low watershed health scores, a complicated urban context, including illegal encampments, poor water quality, and impediments to restoration. Um, the Jordan River is highly valued by those in proximate lower income neighborhoods. And the river is the focus of major multi-jurisdictional and collaborative planning and action that's driven by community-based goals. 
And we can see a shift in the historic master and user relationship types to more stewardship and more participant type relationships with the river. And interest groups are interacting and coming together in an array of common purposes for the better good of the broader community. The Gallatin River in Montana is a very different, in a very different landscape. It has higher watershed health scores than the Jordan River, though not perhaps as high as some of those most pristine rivers in the region. Uh, this image shows that part of the watershed has very high uh, watershed health ratings for the state, while the other half is much lower on watershed health. The Gallatin River originates in Yellowstone Park. It flows northward through a beautiful mountain canyon and out into a wide valley where there's agricultural land and a very uh, rapidly growing metropolitan urban area called Bozeman. And about halfway down the mountain canyon, there is a resort, Big Sky, the Big Sky Ski Resort. Um, it's a major resort destination and growing very fast. And this represents a major source of stress on this otherwise pristine mountain river. You see, about 20 years ago, a wealthy developer began expanding on the Big Sky footprint by building the Yellowstone Club at Big Sky. This is a private club for the very wealthy. Members include Bill Gates and Justin Timberlake. Uh, houses start at $5 million and go on up to $35 million. And you must have assets of over $30 million to be a member. In the first years of the development of this Yellowstone Club, there was tremendous devastation to the wetlands and the watershed. As they built the ski runs, they completely obliterated wetlands in the process. And the tributaries of the Gallatin River that come from Big Sky and the Yellowstone Club um, were then designated as impaired. The Yellowstone Club was fined $1.8 million for the wetland violations in 2004. Keep in mind that this is less than the cost of one of the lowest priced houses in the area. And then the club was fined again more recently in 2016 as there was a spill of 30 million gallons of treated wastewater because they put the wastewater pond up on a hill in a landslide prone area. Hmm. Uh, even though I'm told that the Yellowstone Club spent about $10 million for restoration to remediate the problems that they caused, let's remember that this is less than a third of the assets of one member of this club. The Gallatin River Task Force is a nonprofit organization that grew up to help monitor and protect the river in the face of all of this development. And their monitoring efforts show that nitrate concentrations exceed the threshold of 0.1 milligrams per liter that is, um, can lead to algal growth under certain circumstances uh, at some times of year. While it's not yet close to the drinking water standard of one milligram per liter, um, a representative of the task force says that the nitrate levels, all, along with the sediment levels and other concerns, are increasing in the tributaries as well as the main stem of the river. And the problem is not likely to go away soon as Big Sky is expected to see a billion dollars of new development over the next decade. And given that this total area we were talking about is over 31,000 square, uh, 31,000 hectares. It's about 75% of the city area of Vienna. This continued development will undoubtedly have a major impact on the river and its tributaries. As a watershed scientist said to me recently, it's just too much development at too high of an elevation. Nevertheless, the Gallatin River Task Force works hard to monitor water quality, restore streams, provide education for youth and community members, and promote water conservation uh, because many downstream are very concerned about having enough water, particularly in light of both upstream development as well as climate impacts on snowpack. And I, there's a short video that we have, as long as we're doing okay on time. Okay. Um, the problem is, is that the screen here has not advanced. I don't know if someone can help me get there. He's coming. I don't want to touch it because I'll screw it up. <laughs> yeah, I, do, I just don't want to touch it. We get to the video. No. 
not sure why it's not there. There we go. Okay, and then you scroll down here. Oh, it's not working. Well, we may not be able to see this video. I can describe it for you. Give it 10 more seconds. <laughs> okay, all right, well, we'll skip it, too bad. Um, Well, it's this link here, if you'd like, right here, www. Yeah, no, that went out about half an hour ago. Um, GallatinRiverTaskForce.org, if you scroll down, there's a video on the right. But essentially what it talks about is people trying to, um, remembering what this river was like for them 50 years ago, and, and really wanting this river to have this wonderful sense of quality of life um, 50 years from now even though development is going to continue and, and to, and to take place. And it describes the involvement of, of young children in these uh, restoration efforts and in monitoring the rivers, and it shows really this impact that this experience is having with children. And if you'd have seen it, it then these research questions that I pose would maybe make a little bit more sense, but it, I, it led me to ask the question of, what is the influence of engaging children in river science and river restoration later in their lives? And does engaging children influence their parents' attitudes and actions? And then more broadly, how do restoration efforts and river conditions change as a community grows and changes demographically and socioeconomically? Uh, this type of work may not necessarily be what you think of when you think of river science. But I think this sort of longitudinal research uh, would add to our understanding of river conditions. Um, to summarize the Gallatin River situation, despite high upstream watershed health scores, and because of this resort, big resort development and posing a threat to, the, to water quality and water quantity, significant interaction is emerging. Um, uh, among water organizations and stakeholders. There's a shift happening from the more of a user orientation of this river to human relationships that embody more stewardship, promoting guardianship among those who perhaps only come for a brief time and live um, in a far distant place. Overall, trying to get people to participate more in improving and enjoying the river. Representatives of various interest groups, the task force, a downstream watershed coalition, downstream farmers, local residents, the county government, and even developers are working together to, in, with a common purpose of protecting this river even while the community grows over time. We can see when we compare these two rivers, the Jordan River and the Gallatin River, um, that it's about more than just land cover, more than just the domains of, that we use to measure the watershed health, it's more than the context of an urban versus a mountain setting. The socio-demographic, socio-economic, and biophysical contexts of these rivers are different. And while some of the human river relationships are somewhat similar and the relation changes are similar, there are also important nuances and differences in how these human river relationships are unfolding in these places. So remembering, our, reminding ourselves of the core principles of social ecology and applying them to rivers, we can see that assessing the multidimensional structures at different levels of analysis is important, both for riverscapes and their broader contexts. Uh, we need to better understand the multiple, the multi-jurisdictional and hydro, eco-hydrologic systems and the dynamic human river relationships that shape outcomes related to river conditions and the well-being of people. And we in river science are going to need to work together using diverse methods and reaching out beyond science to involve the professional and local knowledge in riverscapes or, in fact, 
to join the local and the professional knowledge that's already at work and bring our science into an already uh, working environment there to maintain healthy watersheds and riverscapes. This is a picture of my son Jack and I, two novice paddlers floating down the Danube a few years ago uh, with Professor Muhar's husband Andreas. Um, what you can't see is us spinning around in circles screaming as we try to dodge the riverboat cruises and the barges as we float down the Danube. Um, I will say it's great to be back in Austria, but I might sit on the riverbank a bit more this year. Um, there are a number of people who I need to acknowledge, my students Casey and Nabila who did a lot of this work, the mapping work in particular, and people on the Jordan and Gallatin rivers, and I thank you, and I would be happy to hear um, any of your comments or take any questions you might have. Thank you very much.